Hello friends, I want to thank God who has been with us. He has led us up to this time. May his name be glorified. Amen. Uh, we don't take this for granted. It has been only by God's grace and his mercies that we have made it to this day when we are having some few days to the end of the lockdown. Well, we don't know whether it will be pushed further or whether uh, some ways will be opened, some measures will be lifted. But all in all, we thank God who has sustained us, he has been with us, and may his name be glorified. I want to thank God for you in a special way because you are able to watch uh, these presentations, these interactions, and from them we have learned great lessons, especially uh, for our spiritual journey and for our motivation as God's people, so that we don't lose hope, but we know that all in all, God is with us and he will sustain us will be faithful to us till the end friends i want to thank you and uh, my thanks are beyond the description to you for always watching following and uh, making it a point God is watch these summons. May God bless you. And I pray that the Lord will be with us and continue teaching us through this time, even in the time to come. And today, uh, I also want to thank Brother Mayor China Kuot for the good work he's doing, especially concerning these presentations. Now today, in uh, our Friday fellowship, Sabbath welcome, uh, we are going to share a message from the book of Judges, chapter 6. And uh, our main emphasis will be on verse 12 and uh, verse 13. But then we shall also make use of the of that whole story from verse 11. The story talks about Gideon. I hope many of us have read the story. But today I want us to look at the story in another angle. Sometimes when we are reading these stories, it also depends on which angle you look at the story from. Now, friends, today we are going to share a message that is titled, How Does God Look at You? How Does God Look at You? Let us pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for leading us and being our guide till this time. May your name be glorified forever and ever. Lord, we want to thank you for all the messages you've given to us in the past. And now we are also going to share this message titled, How Does God Look at You? We pray that you be with us and be our guide as we share. It is our humble prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, how does God look at you? The book of Judges is a book written after the Israelites have reached the promised land. They have settled, each, tri each uh, tribe has received its portion of the land. Everyone has settled and now they are already in the land of milk and honey. They are enjoying. But when we read in the first chapters, 
we find that when the Israelites reached in Canaan, the promised land, they forgot the God who brought them right from Egypt up to Canaan. They forgot the Lord who brought their grandfathers from the land of slavery to the land of milk and honey. They forgot the God who rescued their grandfathers from slavery. And now they are in the land where they have all the freedom. They have forgotten the Lord who led them through the desert, who provided unto them the manna in the wilderness, who always led them by himself through the cloud and the fire. And now, in the comfortable zone, in the land of milk and honey, where they have all the fruits they need, all the food they need, all they need was there. And now, the best reward they could give to God, the best gratitude, the best thanks they would give to God, according to them, was to leave him. And they follow other gods. These people, they left this God who had done all these great things for them, and they went for other gods. Friends, it is against this background that we come to Judges chapter 6, where we find the story of the Midianites oppressing the Israelites. The Israelites, as we have said, had left God and now they were with other gods. And because of this, the Israelites became weak, though they thought they were strong. They became so the, their immunity that was being provided by God. The immunity that led them to fight against other nations. God withdrew the immunity. And now in a state where they thought they were rich, where they thought they are okay, it is in that state that God was no longer with them. And these nations found it simple to always attack them. Friends, it is also worth to remember that the wars that always happened, especially those we read in the Old Testament, between Maybe the Philistines and the Israelites, the Midianites and the Israelites, the Amorites and the Israelites, all those wars in the background, they were wars of the gods. If we are the Philistines and we, uh, we fight the Israelites and defeat them, then it means the god of the Philistines is stronger. If the Midianites can oppress the Israelites, it means the God of the Midianites is stronger than the God of the Israelites. That was the perception. But friends, the God of Israel was always above all other gods. The Israelites sometimes lost because they had forgotten their God. Now, in Judges chapter 6, we have this opening verse which says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. God said, okay, you can face the Midianites. And these people went and faced the Midianites. 
and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. Now, because of living God, because of relying on themselves and their false gods, when the Midianites came, we are told that the Israelites even fled from their homes. They went and they made for themselves dens and caves. Imagine you have built your good mansion, but now you are living in a cave in a certain mountain, in a certain hill, because you are fearing an oppression. And they left their things, they left their gardens, they left their houses, they went to dwell in the mountains, in the caves and in the dens. So it was whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up, also Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. The immunity has become, it has gone so low that even others have said, oh, <laughs> Yeah, we can also attack and we enjoy tormenting these people. Friends, the Israelites, we are now facing oppression from very many groups. And then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. When they would come, they would take everything and they would leave these people languishing. These people, they had been in a state that was so miserable. Actually, it was a state of impoverishment. Nothing good was left with them. Verse 5, for they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. For they and their camels were without number, and I would enter the land to destroy. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all those who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Verse 10 tells us that all these things were happening, because the Israelites were not obeying God's voice. Friends, this was a poor state, a state of impoverishment. I want us to think about our life. Are we living lives of impoverishment? You might have thought you are stronger and you no longer need God. You forget that God who delivered you from that situation of bondage, from that bad situation. But when he has brought you into a good situation, you forget about him. But friend, you may soon become like the Israelites who faced impoverishment after they had left 
God. The devil is always waiting for a time when you will leave God and he exercises his game on you. He will bring the oppression because he knows that you no longer have the protection. So friends, it is important to keep with that God who has led you from that far to this time and it is always important to glorify his name. Now friends, against this background we come to our main verses. 11, 12, and 13, now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terrible tree, which was in offer, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press, in order to hide it from the Midianites. This text tells us that Gideon himself is in a state of Impoverishment. He is threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, a wine press was something with a depression where they would squeeze the vines and all these other fruits they were getting wine from, and the wine would slop. So they would get clear wine. It is where Gideon is hiding and he is threshing wheat in a wine press. He is hiding and now the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. This angel seems to be having good news. You mighty man of Vera. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of Vera. Remember, the angel is talking to Gideon when Gideon is hiding. When Gideon sees no future. When Gideon has lost hope. When Gideon sees this one as a lifetime oppression. But the voice Gideon is receiving, the news Gideon is receiving, is that the Lord is with you, mighty man of Vela. Friends, this one tells us that the way God was looking at Gideon, God was looking at Gideon as a mighty man of Vela. God was looking at Gideon as a mighty man. God was looking at Gideon as a man who would do great things. God was looking at Gideon as a man who would bring change. God was looking at Gideon as a man who would lead the rest and bring them to success. God was looking at Gideon as someone who would restore hope to the rest of Israel. God was looking at Gideon as someone who can stand out from the crowd and do something. God was seeing Gideon as the hope of Israel. But friends, Gideon is hiding. And Gideon had an answer. In verse 13, Gideon said to him, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? So now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Friends, from Gideon's answer, we learn many things also. One, when we leave God, we don't we lose even the trust in in Him. 
we have doubts in him. Gideon, because of this situation, he is saying, if the Lord is with us, Yeah, doubts we are very many. He said, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? In our days, when something happens, people say, government, where are you? Gideon might have also been saying, God, where are you? We need you, but you are nowhere to be seen. But friend, as we saw in the previous verses, we saw that God had delivered them. God had left them because they had not taken heed of his voice. They had not obeyed him. They had forsaken him and went to worship other gods. But friends, God did not give up on Gideon. Verse 14, he says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? God is telling him, I have sent you. You are mighty. A mighty man of Vera. Go and save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. God, in a brief, has chosen Gideon. He's saying, go, I am with you. Go, you are mighty, you can, do, you can make it. Now, Gideon is puzzled. For me, how can I save Israel? And Gideon has very many excuses. In verse 15, he says, so he said to him, Oh my Lord, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the least in my father's house. Gideon is saying, Ah, please God, don't, don't tamper. I am the weakest in my family. How can I save Israel? And the, my clan is even the smallest. My clan is the weakest in Manasseh. In other words, Gideon is trying to bring to God his background. Saying, God for my can't manage because that one is hard for me. My clan is the weakest. And also, I am the weakest at home. How can I manage? I am the least in my father's house. But friends, we need to know that the way we look at things is not the way God looks at things. God told the prophet Samuel when he was going to anoint David, and all the elder brothers came somewhere when he saw the he said, Yeah, I think this is the king. Because the guy had the body. The guy had the height. The guy had the muscles. Said, This is the king. Most probably, what Samuel had in mind was what was considered in anointing soul. But God had a different thing this time. God told him, I don't see as men see. God does not see as men see. Gideon is trying to bring the background, but God does not see as we see. There are many things that we look at as human beings and we think, yeah, these are the best. These are the right things. But then God, God takes you to a different direction. 
You may say, this is the profession I want. But then God has a different direction that he wants you to take that is better for you. Gideon has brought all these excuses. But friends, God is saying, go. It is important for you and me to think about how God thinks about us. Sometimes we see ourselves as the weakest. We see ourselves as the least. But we forget that we are tagged with a great value. We forget that God sees us as mighty men and mighty ladies and mighty women of Vela. When God is seeing you, he sees someone with ability, someone with strength, someone with the brain to think, someone with the capacity to do great things. But when he comes to you, you say, God, you know I'm the least in my father's house. God, you know, for me, even my family is very poor. Our background is very humble. How can I make this? Friends, God does not want to listen to our excuses. It was the same situation with Moses. When God came and said, go and rescue the children of Israel. Moses said, you know God, I'm not able. You know I stammer. You see God, I ran away from Egypt. Now you see God, how can I go back? Now God, you can look for someone else. Now God, please leave me alone. But God said, you will go. The Bible tells us that God said, okay, you will go with your brother. But then when we read in all those stories, we are told it is Moses who spoke. God does not want to listen to our excuses. God does not want to listen to your excuse. When he says go, he has already made a way. God tells us that he will make us heads and not tails. God has already made you a head. Don't say for me, God, you see, I'm supposed to be a tail. Please, God, you can leave me. So and so can be the head. No. God is making you a head, not the tail. He will make a way for your success. Let us be like Isaiah who said, here I am. O oh Lord, send me. Say, here I am, God. Give me wisdom. Give me knowledge and understanding to do your will. Let us not be like Gideon who is portraying excuses. Well, God confirms to him in verse 16 and he says, Surely I'll be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. God says he will be with you. Don't fear about your following. Someone says, me I cannot give my idea because I don't know who, who will agree with me. No. If it is God's idea, it doesn't matter who will agree with you. God will make a way for it to work. When you read in chapter 7, Gideon went ahead to go and fight. But then, he looked for a very big army. He said, yeah, since there are many, let me also look for a big army. But God chopped the army. The army of thousands was reduced to 300. And Gideon said, Oh God, how can this be? Only 300! God said, No. 
for you just to go. These ones are enough. Friends, God does not want us to have very many things for us to do his will. In fact, God does not use very great things. Why? Because when we use those great things, those great tools, those great weapons, we shall come to think that we attained the success because of our selves, because of your might. God wanted Gideon to use 300 so that he knows that surely it is God who has fought this battle. God did not use weapons and shields and swords when David was attacking Goliath. But God just walked through one stone and one sling. And the game was over. God does not need those great things. Some of the people say, Well, I think I will serve God when I become rich. I think... I'll give tithes and offerings when my income is one million plus. God does not need great things. Begin with the small that you have. Where there is a will, there is a way. God sees you as a mighty man, as a mighty woman of Vera. What do you do now? Step forward. And the Lord will be with you. God has given you what you need to move forward and to attain the success. May God bless us and be our guide. As we always think about how God thinks about us, let's always remember that God, the way he thinks about us, he thinks about us as people who are mighty, who should be successful, who should do great things, who should stand for him, who should not be shaken because we are standing on him, the rock of ages. Let us have our trust in God and surely God will lead us to great hates. He sees you as a mighty man and a mighty woman of Vera. Step forward and run for success. He will be with you till the end. Let's close this with a prayer. We thank you Lord for being with us. Thank you for teaching us that the way you look at us, you look at us as mighty people of Vera. You look at us as people who are blessed and who should do great things. So we should, we should not settle for small things. We should not belittle ourselves. You, say, you tell us in the book of Deuteronomy 28, 13, that you created us to be heads and not tails. Lord, we pray that you be with us and may you always know that the pause, the thoughts you have for us are good thoughts and they are positive towards our success. We pray that we always acknowledge that the thoughts you have for us are thoughts of prosperity and not of evil so that we can do many great things in you. Let us always stand in you. Let us always stand on you the solid rock. Let our trust be in you always, so that the Lord you lead us to great heights. It is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless you.